James, how do you view the challenge in front of you as an executive team for the next yeah. season moving forward? How would you describe the challenge? Um, it's an exciting one for us. It's an exciting one for us because we've got real confidence in the manager, Michael, the plan that he's presented in terms of the on the pitch opportunities in terms of recruitment, but also some of the off the pitch items that we're looking at. So um, I don't think we underestimate it. I don't think we underplay it. But I think, you know, we're now looking at it with optimism, with excitement, but we're also cognizant that there's a lot of work to do over the next two, three months. And the decisions that we take can define the next two, three seasons. So no, we're feeling positive, but uh, you know, we're ready to put the work in as well. The manager said it, it's quite an extensive rebuild in terms of players coming in and out. Yeah. From your side of things, as a club, will you need to put more resource in this summer than perhaps you'd initially wanted to or, or would do in ideal circumstances? Yeah, I'm not sure it's putting in more resource. I think um, if you look at the evolution of the squad, there's obviously a, a greater number of players than usual, if you like, that are going to leave Rangers for whatever reason. So I don't think the resources are anything that's additional, but I think you know the, the level of transformation is probably going to be more than we've more than we've seen before. But as I said earlier in the week, you know, Michael together with John Park, our chief scout, and Fraser Murray, they're kind of the, the scouting data analytics manager, they put together a plan that's been two, three months in the making, if not longer. Obviously Ross Wilson was involved in that before he left us as well. So the plan that they presented, you know, for us it's exciting. It's achievable, but at the same time, you know, we're going to need to be prepared to react to moments and, and, and that process because it's, it's not a linear process because you're, you're dealing with players that are considering what's right for them and their family. You're dealing with agents that are doing something in the best interest of the player, but also have got a commercial lens on everything and, and, and other clubs. So it's not as straightforward as going through a tick list of what we need to deliver. But you know we've got the backing from the board, from the chairman, John Park, from all of the major investors to execute this plan. And we've, we've been at it now for a few weeks. We are well advanced in a number of those conversations uh, and we're really focused to, to get it done um, because we know that's what's gonna make the difference for, for Rangers next season. When every little income stream is, is, is vital, how frustrating is it that a couple of assets have been allowed to sort of wind down their contracts potentially well, and we, we know Alfredo's going to go it looks like Ryan yeah. Kemp will go is that something moving forward that the club needs to learn from? Potentially I think you know it's been spoken about before by by the manager by Ross when he was here you know you, you, we cannot insist we cannot force a player to sign a contract it's, it's their prerogative to take a decision but what is important to us is getting the player trading model right which means our recruitment decisions need to be spot on and needs to be backed up by great scouting, great analytics, and they need to be the players that the manager's identified and that the manager wants. But we also need to build value in the squad. And I think you saw us execute that plan with Calvin Bassey leaving to Ajax and Joe Rebo and Nathan Patterson. So it's never a perfect art, but the player trading model is one that we believe in and we've shown that it can work at Rangers and we want to build a value in this squad so that we, 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 can, we can have that model that's something that's got resources that are reinvested in the future as well. Final question from me, I'll sure. hog the, the floor. Uh, given your commercial background and, and seeking to make the most of any strength or, or selling point of the products you're looking after, is yeah. there an appetite from you to try and get back to the file locations for the old firm fixture? Because the general consensus is that the selling product, of, the selling points of that product, have been yeah. damaged a little bit by not having a way allocation. Yeah, so I, th I think it's it's definitely an area we're going to look at, and we're going to have dialogue with with all the right stakeholders, all the right authorities, be that Police Scotland, be that Celtic, uh, and we, we we hear and we recognise all the different viewpoints on that. So yes, absolutely, we're gonna we're gonna look at that, and then we'll see where those discussions go in terms of in terms of next season. James. Um there's been a lot of change off the field I think, just in a very short period of time. Yeah. What was the rationale behind that? Because you just mentioned that you probably didn't plan as much transformation in the squad. Yeah. Was it the same maybe perhaps you would have liked to have done this over a longer period, but this just felt like the right opportunity? Yeah, and I think the first thing to say there, David, is that there are a lot of people that have moved on from Rangers that had unbelievable contributions to, to the football club. And I think... The chairman, the board and myself, I think we, we want to thank all of those people for what they did over different periods of time. They'll always be welcomed back at Rangers and, and people left for, for different reasons. You know, that's, that's normal in life and in, in, in business. And it just so happened that a number of those changes were quite truncated. 
But I think what we see now is that's a platform for a positive evolution. We've spoken already about on the, on the pitch transformation. And I think we've got a similar opportunity in terms of off the pitch. And roles such as the sporting director, academy director, uh, the commercial and marketing director, you know, they, they are integral to our future strategy and the future success of the club. So we're really positive and excited by some of the conversations that we're having in those areas specifically. The, the types of profiles that are putting themselves forward to, to join Rangers, I think you know, that, that just shows the stature of the club and what an opportunity that is for different individuals. So uh, we've got to get those decisions right. We've got to take sound judgment on those. But I think we're, we're looking at that in a really optimistic manner as well in terms of having the on the pitch and the off the pitch team in place to start next season from the strongest possible footing. And you mentioned there uh, Douglas Park, the outgoing chairman. What would you say his legacy is now from, from his time at, at Rangers? Yeah, I think Douglas has a, has a fantastic legacy over a long period of time. You know, what the Parks family have given Rangers is, is something that really should be ad admired by, by, by all supporters. Um, from a personal perspective, you know, Douglas, for me as a chairman, was a brilliant support during, during you know, a, a lot of different ups and downs you know, at, at the club. And you know, Graham Park still remains on the, on the club's board, representing the park's family interests. So Douglas's legacy will be 55, if you like, will be a European final. And the park's family will still be there backing this board. And we've still got a really strong relationship with them. James, you mentioned um, in your club um, press conference that you would be discussing again safe standing. Yeah, that is obviously key to a lot of supporters' feelings, a lot yeah. of the supporters' group, um, especially obviously like union bears, etc. Yeah. There's a sense, perhaps, that these sometimes are just words, and we've said before that we're going to do studies and it's never came. So there's a frustration amongst the support. Yeah. Can you explain a wee bit more about? how you're going to go about evaluating that situation, what the process is going to be, and perhaps a timeline where the support can get some answers on what the board have decided to do. Yeah, no, fair question. I'll try and be as specific and as tangible as possible. So we last week we had a quarterly uh, RFC board meeting and we discussed some of the infrastructure works. Um, and you know one of the ones that we've confirmed is the improvement to the disabled facilities. And that's a three year plan in terms of the closed seasons of 23, 24 and 25 to install new platforms for disabled supporters, but also new cantilevers on the Copeland and the Broomland stands that will increase the capacity. So what we are looking at is within those windows of works, and it won't be this summer, but potentially next summer or the summer after, can we use that as an opportunity for other stadium infrastructure projects? And safe standing is one that I personally think would bring a lot of positives in terms of stadium atmosphere. I've seen at other stadiums across Europe how beneficial that can be for the, for the home fans that really want to get behind the team and they want to enjoy the match experience in that way. And it's key that it's safe standing and you know, that's where all the tests have been absolutely robust to prove that that's the case. So what we will do in the next six months is revisit the feasibility of that from an infrastructure point of view, so working with the stadium architects. And in parallel, we will also talk to the supporter groups, the supporter groups that have been lobbying, if you like, for want of a better phrase, for safe standing, but also those that are concerned about it. And they might be concerned because it means that their seat might not be their seat, if, depending where we put it. So. We're going to have that dialogue, but we're going to have it in a meaningful way. And it's an area that I am supportive of. And I know that others on the board are also supportive of it. So um, I feel optimistic about it, but I can't give a guarantee until we've run through this process. James, on the issue of the no away fans and no firm games, you're talking about perhaps a mood change now. Are there talks planned with Celtic? Is there a real feeling amongst Rangers that this needs to change for next season? Uh, there's no specific date in the diary for those talks, but I imagine during the summer and before the next Old Firm game that the, the dialogue will take will take place. How would you solve that problem, James, given that season tickets are, or will be sold, are sold? So for, for, for next season, the season tickets have not been sold in the corner of the govern stand uh, where the allocation was previously. So for next season, we do have the opportunity, if we decide to reinstate the previous allocation, which I think was seven, seven, eight hundred. And that, so that, that's almost, if you like, our, our maximum for next season. And then beyond that, it's a, it's, a, it's a broader conversation. But we need to have the dialogue with those stakeholders because there are a lot of different views on it. But we will definitely have that conversation. Do you see a time when the full allocation will be given? 
I would struggle to commit to that now because there are so many there are so many aspects to to, to, to that conversation. James, can I ask you about um, the manager, Michael Beale? Ultimately, he'll be judged by success on the field, yeah. and normally that means by lifting titles, yeah. winning cups. Yeah. Um, Celtic seem to have a stranglehold at the moment anyway in terms of the finances as well. How do you give Michael the resources required to bridge that gap yeah. at the moment? Yeah, I think it goes back to my previous answer in terms of the, the recruitment and the plan for the squad this summer. You know, if, if we get the recruitment decisions right, and I think you don't have to look too far back to the, the January transfer window and the acquisitions of Nico Raskin and Todd Campwell and the positive impact that they've had on the squad. So if we can get those recruitment decisions right, then we've got a lot of optimism and a lot of belief that the Rangers team that will be on the park next season will be a winning Rangers team. And, you know, traditionally Rangers has been the dominant team in Scotland. Clearly, that hasn't been the case last season or the season before. But we've got a lot of belief in the manager. We've got a lot of belief in the, the strategy of the club, the scouting team. And that's why, that's why we're optimistic. But we'll see what next season brings. But I think it's right that we are positive and optimistic because that plan is in place and because we've already made good inroads in terms of executing that plan. You said um, to Mark that there may not be more resources made available. Would you look at um, any external funding? Any, are you looking for any new funding to come into the club that could help Michael? So, so yeah. So for now, the plan that Michael's presented has the board's approval and has the full support of the board. So that, that plan is obviously a recruitment plan in terms of a number of players and the strategy behind that. The board are supportive of that. The chairman supported, supported the plan, the investors have supported the plan, and the directors have supported the plan. So that's the focus at the moment, but the support is there to deliver that plan. But is there any option there, or are you currently seeking any further investment into the club? As I said, because the board and the investors have supported that plan, the, the backing is there for it to be, to be executed with the board and the investors that are in place. Could you bring us up to speed as to where the club is at with transfer targets, Ciferentes, Dell, Rutland? Yeah, uh, Sterling. What can you tell us? Yeah, so I mean, it's not it's not for me to comment on specific names, but as I said, what I can give you is the overarching club strategy, and within that plan for summer recruitment, we've already made, I would say, positive inroads in terms of some of those conversations, and I don't think we're too far away from being able to make uh, announcements and to communicate that specifically. But look. I think we need to recognise we're sitting here in mid-April, the season hasn't finished, it's a long road until we get to pre-season and next season. So there'll need to be an element of patience before that plan is completely executed. But as I said, we're already up, up and running, we've had a good start and I think there'll be some, some exciting news to share very soon. You talked about uh, in the interview with Rangers TV about Rangers becoming the dominant force in Scottish football. Yeah. Do you think that could happen next season? I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic. I think Rangers have, over the period of... 150 years of the club over the history of Scottish football have been the dominant team. So I think it's it's right that supporters would expect this board, this leadership, to have that as our ambition. And we've got confidence in Michael as the coach and we've got confidence in his plan in terms of the recruitment for the summer. And can you tell us in terms of the dialogue with Graham Sinus, what was the purpose of that? Where did those conversations go? Yeah, so I mean, Graham, it doesn't need, need me to say, but Graham's an absolute legend of the football club. He's he, he's a, He's an icon um, and you know, I think our strategy will be to make sure that we've got good relationships with a lot of our club legends. And you know, I spoke earlier this week, I think it was even yesterday, to, to Richard Goff and text with Kevin Thompson and Craig Moore. So it's important that we've got those touch points with people that are so, so important to the club's history. Graham, I think, was, was in uh, Glasgow for a private engagement, dropped in for a coffee. It was an informal conversation because we want to maintain that relationship. Hopefully in the future, He'll be involved in, 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 in more opportunities in an ambassadorial sense. You know, I think, I think that's, that's for Graham to decide. But um, I think the, the extent of the rumours probably went a little bit further than the, the reality on that one. Is that ambassadorial role something you guys have discussed? Not specifically. Not specifically. As I said, it was an informal chance just to reconnect because Graham happened to be in Glasgow and he loves to come into Ibrox. We had a coffee. We had a great conversation. Uh, and, and, and that was that was all for now. What would it mean if someone like him was to be involved in some sort of capacity at the club? I think, as I've said, for all of the ex-players, you know, you look at John Gregg, the greatest ever Rangers, Ranger is still there every day on a match day. To have our ex-players that are supportive of the club, it's important because they understand the club, 
the supporters connect with them. So absolutely, we want to make sure that we keep those relationships strong. In terms of the uh, the allocation, you mentioned that there was kind of almost like pressure coming from governor governing uh, bodies and sponsors. Do, do you find that there is though, uh, as I've been finding, is that most of the supporters who are at Ibrox are actually content with the situation as it is just now? Yeah, I don't think there's any pressure. I certainly haven't felt any pressure from from the authorities, but you know, I'm I'm transitioning into the role, so maybe that pressure will, will will come at one point. But we will take the decision that is right for Rangers and is right for our supporters. So as I said, there will be that dialogue. I think the question was, you know, is it is there the chance to go back to the traditional allocation of the eight thousand? I think that's very unlikely at the moment. We need to see where the conversations go, but I, I don't think that's something that looks imminent, I would say, Mark. Uh, and, and if I could just last add another one. In terms of uh, your role at the club, it's obviously changed over time. Yeah. But also the, the club itself has moved from a long recovery period yeah. to that point where we're now engaged in um, major transfer sales. You know, there's, there's less and less uh, investment in shares coming through. Yeah. Do you see this year being pivotal to Rangers running as a normal football club once again, rather than being dependent upon um, you know, the, the injection of funds from shareholders. I do, yeah, I do. And I think you know, last year, our financial performance was the strongest for a very long time. We had a record revenue. We returned to profitability. Uh, we're still really fortunate that we've got investors that are prepared to back the club and they're ambitious in terms of where we want to go. But we want to operate in a sustainable way, and that's that's how we will that's how we'll set up and set up the business in, in the future. You know, we've got those revenue pillars, the, the the season the season ticket money, the European revenue, player trading, commercial, all of those areas we are seeking to maximise. And you know, as we do that, we will, as you say, we'll leave the recovery period behind, and then it's a growth trajectory from 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 there on in for Rangers.